We couldn't be more excited to have Joanne Lublin join us today. She is a legend in the journalism world. She was the Wall Street Journal's career columnist until May 2020. She also long served as its managing news editor, working with reporters on coverage of workplace issues from executive pay and succession planning to corporate governance and recruiting trends. She is the author of two books, and her latest is Power Moms, How Executive Mothers Navigate Work and Life. We hope you enjoy this episode. So Joanne, we're so excited to have you here. It's like I've known your name for years being in the PR game. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we're talking to a lot of women about is just their own journey. And you've had such an amazing career. You're a household name for institutions, enterprise. You know, you've covered so many issues and the ways that organizations can really um move them move themselves forward whether it's de and i to corporate governance it's like you've you've definitely reported on the plethora of topics so you know I, i'd love to kind of start if it, you know in terms of like did you always know you wanted to be a journalist well i kind of always knew that i wanted to be a writer because in second grade there was a pta newsletter it published one of my poems put my name underneath and i was like "Ooh, that's kind of cool so when I was in fourth grade, a bunch of fourth and fifth graders decided we were going to create a newspaper for our elementary school. We had a contest to come up with the name. I won the contest. It was called the News and Views of Walt Whitman Elementary School. For my first bylined article in the elementary school newspaper, I interviewed the school nurse and said things like, well, how do you know if a student is sick? She said, I take their temperature. And I thought, oh, Breaking news. I guess I, have to, I guess I have to write that down. What are I now? <laughs> Nine years old. In answer to your question, yes, I, I did always want to be a writer. I didn't really know what a journalist was. Um, and in fact, I came up with a, a pen name that I wrote in the back of my diary when I was 10 or 11. I was going to call myself like Mark Twain. I was going to call myself Marcy Wayne. <laughs> oh my God, that's adorable. That's amazing. In terms of, you know, you know, how did you, it's like you've been, you were the longest news editor for the management column at the journal. You created a couple institutions at the Wall Street Journal. You know, what was your, what was your journey like, you know, in terms of coming up in the industry? It's like, how has it changed and what have you seen? Well, given that I go back a few decades, I've seen a lot of <laughs> You've it. seen a lot. Yeah. I started out my career at the Wall Street Journal as a summer intern in the Washington Bureau. And I got that summer internship through a nonprofit called the Newspaper Fund. The Newspaper Fund was created by Dow Jones originally in order to encourage men and liberal arts colleges to go into journalism. The summer that I was chosen for the Newspaper Fund internship program, they opened it up to women and to journalism majors. The way the journal worked was they ran this newspaper fund program and then participating newspapers would choose interns who had been chosen for their internships. But what I didn't realize is the Wall Street Journal skimmed off the top and offered internships to, I guess, what they considered the best of the newspaper fund interns. I was offered a job in the Washington Bureau by a letter from the bureau chief. So being the good investigative journalist I was already at the school newspaper, I called collect, had the bureau chief accept the charges and say, is this letter legitimate? And how many other interns will you have in the bureau? Am I gonna be the only girl? That's how my journalism career started. Oh my God. So that's fantastic. That's amazing. <laughs> but here's the really weird thing. There already was one full-time female reporter in that bureau. She had come over from the Washington Post style section, and I never saw her read any stories. She only sat there and read the style section of the Washington Post, as far as I could tell. She certainly didn't ever reach out to me. I felt no sense of sisterhood to her. And so I felt kind of lost. And the very first day I went into a staff meeting in the Washington Bureau as a summer intern, all the guys, and there were only guys in the room at that point, stood up when I entered the room. I didn't know what to do. I turned around and looked to see if the Queen of England was behind me. <laughs> but again, this is how the world worked at that time. Oh my gosh. And were you- Fast the forward, I graduated from Northwestern and the Medill School of Journalism. There were no journalism jobs. So I figured, all right, I'll go get another degree. 
went out to Stanford, got a master's degree, did my master's thesis on the burning question, is there discrimination against women on American newspapers? <laughs> and got hired by the Wall Street Journal in the San Francisco Bureau when I finished Stanford. I was the first woman hired for the San Francisco Bureau in a full-time reporting position. What I later found out after I joined the journal was that during World War II, when many men went off to war, there were news assistants and secretaries, all women, of course, who got drafted into doing some of the more less, let's put it hard hitting type of journal reporting, uh, the daily stuff, because there weren't enough guys. And then when the guys came back from the war, guess what happened? They all got displaced. Yes. They all got demoted back to being secretaries and news assistants, essentially not being reporters anymore. So I walk into a newsroom in which I'm the only female full-time reporter, uh, and they've never had one in that bureau, all guys. Uh, I, I tell this story fairly frequently, but my first impression was that there was something wrong there. I had worked at the Daily Northwestern where we were all equal opportunity slaves. We just worked 24 seven, we put out a paper five days a week, they didn't care if you were man, woman or beast, just get the story. Yeah. But in this world, there were several male reporters who had pin up calendars on their desks. Oh, you know, a, a different female nude for every month. And here I am, I'm straight out of school. I've never <laughs> worked in a real office other than yeah. as a intern. I don't have any power over these guys. Or yeah. Why? What, so what was your beat power. at that point? I'll tell you what my beat was, but let me just, if you want, indulge me, finish the story. Yeah, yeah. You know, I go out and I buy a calendar with male nudes. <laughs> male nudes every month. <laughs> That's hysterical. I put it up on what was then known as a bulletin board. And there it stayed for less than 24 hours, disappeared. No one claimed you know, where it had gone. <laughs> Now, in answer to your other question, I, my initial beat was covering the gold industry because there were apparently a lot of gold mining companies that were based in San Francisco. I knew absolutely nothing about business journalism whatsoever. I just kind of dived in feet first. Oh my gosh. And did you stay then in, in management and in business from the beginning? Well, if you work for the Wall Street Journal, you're covering management and business issues, obviously. But no, I wasn't in management. I was just a reporter. I didn't go into covering management and covering no. management and business. Yes, covering yeah. management. Again, you're going to have to fast forward many years, go from San Francisco to Chicago, Chicago to Washington. Okay. Then from Washington, I get offered a position in management. I become initially the news editor and then the deputy bureau chief in the London Bureau. And then when I leave the London Bureau to come back to New York, I want to go back to reporting, but I want to create a beat that has never existed before. Yeah. So I created this beat called management and workplace issues that did not exist. And subsequent to taking that beat on, I then began to cover executive pay. We had an annual section on executive pay that I was the editor of. After that, I realized we didn't have any special coverage devoted to career issues. I proposed that we launch a career column, which we did. We also launched a whole page devoted to career coverage and made career issues part of what we were doing as part of our management and workplace coverage. Along the way, I got promoted to something called management news editor, which was more of a, a coverage responsibility than having any kind of large numbers of people reporting to me. And in fact, when I put together Power Moms, one of the things my publisher insisted is that every chapter start with a story about my journey as a working mother. Oh, yeah. As earning it had had a little bit of that and she wanted this to be much more of a memoir. I said, I'm fine with that, but what if there's a chapter where I don't have a relevant experience? I never got beyond a first line supervisor. And I was planning to do a chapter called Better Mom, Better Boss which was going to outline why parenthood teaches us things that make us better bosses or the other way around. Mm -hmm. If we become yeah. a boss first, that prepares us for parenthood. In my case, I had children already at the point when I move into management, but I never thought I was a very good boss. So how was I going to open that chapter? The publisher's reaction when I said, what if I don't have a relevant 
story to tell. She said, well, you just gonna have to tell the readers why you don't have a relevant story. Yeah. So I found the story. Makes it authentic. I, yeah. It makes it authentic in terms of, you know, of what your experiences have been. I think having those touch points um, within your book make it so relatable, right? It's like not every mom has the same journey through, man- you know, so it's it does bring that authenticity to it in terms of your journey. Now, when you were, you know, coming up in the San Francisco Bureau, did you, you know, obviously, you know, as the only female, did you find that you, that the men were, it's like, what was the environment like? Were the men mentors to you? Did you have mentors to help you kind of navigate this, this world of journalism, especially at one of the most esteemed papers to this day on a global basis? It's like that, that had to have been some pressure for you. I felt like I did not have mentors among the, the guys in the office. I did feel my bureau chief was a great mentor mentor. In fact, I remember at the end of the job interview telling him that while I really enjoyed my summer internship and I relished the idea of joining the Wall Street Journal, I did not agree with the editorial page, which was had opinions that did not agree with my political point of view. And I wanted to know, would my stories be slanted to agree with the editorial page? The bureau chief said, the day that happens, Joanne, we will each put on our hats, I didn't wear a hat, but whatever, and we will walk out of this bureau together. So I did regard him in many ways as a great mentor, but the peers, definitely not so. In fact, as I'm sure many of you have experienced, there was a fair amount of hazing that had partly to do with being new and partly to do with being a woman. One of the things that the journal liked to do a lot at this time was to do roundups. So a memo would come out from New York. It would get sent to six bureaus. The bureaus would each report about whatever the topic was, and then they would write a story based on those memos. Generally, you got four or five of those roundups a week. Well, my first day on the job, all those assignments ended up on my desk. So I didn't know. (laughs) I just did them all and turned in all the memos. Well, it turned out that all the guys in the office had handed me their assignments as well as part of the part of the hazing. Oh my oh god. No. Did you feel did you feel discouraged or have the self-doubt that you had to push through working in that type of an environment? It's, you know, at that stage to be in your 20s, it's like you can either take it, I could see it as like you can take it kind of like a pinch of salt and get, you know, kind of laugh at it or did you were were you ever questioning like what am I doing here? <laughs> I did have one day in my career at the Wall Street Journal where I definitely questioned what I was doing there. It did not happen in the early days in San Francisco. Do you want me to share that story? Because it comes later in my career. Yeah, that would be, yeah, absolutely. Well, it comes when I returned from maternity leave for the first time. Mm -hmm. I, I get moved to the Washington Bureau when I'm seven months pregnant with our first child. P.S. I had asked for the transfer at the point when we were trying to get pregnant. My parents lived in the D.C. area. We were living in Chicago. I thought it would be nice if we ever were able to get pregnant to be living within shouting distance of the child's grandparents. But what happened was I asked for the transfer, immediately got pregnant, then had to inform my bureau chief in Chicago that I was pregnant. And his reaction was, oh, I'm so sorry. I was like, no, 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 you don't understand. I plan to come back after maternity leave. He said, you asked me to get you a transfer to Washington. What am I supposed to do now? I said, I'm still willing to move to Washington. So at the beginning of my last trimester, I end up in the Washington Bureau. Fast forward, I take my maternity leave, come back. When my son Dan is about seven months old, the editorial page comes up with this clever idea that another journal colleague and I who had had babies at the same time should write companion essays, in my case, why I returned to work, in her case, why she quit. And they run these essays side by side. They appear in print on the Monday I come back from work after my first long weekend away from our son since his birth. I'm really oh at wit's end because I was so upset about being away from my baby. When I come into the office, I find an entire page of letters to the editor 
reacting to this first person essay about why I chose to work after my son was born. And on my desk is a folder of another 30 letters, frankly, that were too nasty to print, most of which came from stay at home moms, some of which said some things like, your baby Dan is better off that you're going to work every day because you're an unfit mother. That was the day I was ready to quit. Oh my and God. I got a splitting headache. I went home early. And if you want to know what happened next, read that chapter. It's one of the. <laughs> <laughs> and you're still there. Well, um, obviously, I didn't quit, but yeah. Little bit. Did you? Wanna... It's like when you face the types of, you know, rooms of all men, it's like, when did you start seeing that shift or the journal taking responsibility for that kind of equity and, and diversity of thought in their newsrooms? Well, at the point when I joined the journal straight out of Stanford, there were less than roughly a dozen women in the news department. Handful, not even a handful, one of them was above the level of reporter. That woman, as I recall, was a copy editor. And the story I heard, never directly confirmed, is that when she and another journal editor got engaged, they summoned them both to the higher ups, informed them that there was a nepotism policy and everyone looked at her. So she was expected to resign, which apparently she did. This, of course, infuriated me, this kind of yeah. way we treated women. And so I immediately started making this my bully pulpit at the journal to the point that when the then managing editor came in to visit our bureau in Chicago, where I moved next, the, as soon as he saw me, he reached into his pocket and he said, Joanne, I know you're going to ask me how many women and how many black reporters we have, because those were the only two categories we were counting at that time. I've got the numbers right here in my pocket. <laughs> oh my gosh. But it took, it took a long time. And I don't think the journal's you know, totally where it ought to be even today, but it's yeah. a lot, lot better off. The Wall Street Journal now has a female editor in chief for the first time in its history. Yeah. She yeah. started this month. Yeah. It's like that type of advocacy is so powerful. It's like, you're, you're such a role model to so many women and journalists that come up. It's like, I think, you know, journalism is such an interesting field, you know, you're balancing so much from opinions to, you know, where your belief systems are and, you know, and then just authentic reporting, right? A lot of it has to do with paying it forward. So at one point, a group of women at the Wall Street Journal analyzed why there was this disparity in pay between what the female reporters were getting paid and the male reporters. And of course, it turned out that your prior pay gaps were perpetuating themselves. Yeah. But when these findings were presented to management, other issues came up, such as the fact that women were not as often being offered transfers. And there was one woman in particular who had recently come back from maternity leave with twins, already had a four-year-old little girl, she was very eager to move up in the journal and the women at this meeting said, we suspect she would love to be transferred to New York into a higher level position than being a reporter, which she was then doing in LA. And the reaction we got was just that. She's just come back from maternity leave. She has twin babies and a four-year-old, plus her husband works uh, you know, in a journalism job. We don't think she would wanna move from LA to New York. To which every single woman present said, really? Has anyone bothered to ask? Yeah, ask her. It's that, it's that subtle gender bias, the unconscious, yeah. bias, sometimes conscious as well, that we still struggle with today. The assumptions that because someone has a high powered spouse that they're not mobile, or because they have children under a certain age, they wouldn't be willing to relocate, say, out of the country. Or God forbid, she's pregnant, would we? want to consider her for a promotion yeah it's it's the unconscious bias it's you know I think the world is getting better but it's still there I think so strongly you know for women pending on the position and it, and it does come down to just simply ask right just don't assume and it goes and it goes and that plays into it being the fact that you kind of started this movement at the journal and, you know, you kind of became known for it. Did you ever get pushback on it? 
in terms of what you, you know, what was that like in pushing through if, if you were? Well, I think the pushback, it comes in much more subtle forms, even in, you know, years ago. The pushback comes in the form of the guys get invited to the male bureau chief's house for drinks after work, yeah. but the female reporter does not. My bureau chief in San Francisco, who hired me and I adored, invited male reporters out on his sailboat alone. In my case, he invited my husband to come with me, which was probably a smart thing to do. Yeah. But I do recall that it was a while before I got invited out on the sailboat. And so when I left full-time employment at the Wall Street Journal, in order, frankly, to write this next book, I was asked to write a first person essay called uh, a letter to my younger self. You can find it online. Yeah. Yeah. But what I did in that essay is I told my younger self um, as if I was speaking to me on my first day at the wall street journal, here are five things that I wish you had known. And I can now tell you with the vantage point of decades later, yeah. what I wish I had known starting out. And, and one of them was the un written rules of the office. Did you find that, you know, over the years and the beats that you had, you know, whether it was from gold all the way through all of the other types of reporting that you did, did you ever feel like you were being given, I don't want to use the word like a lesser important beat, but a less serious beat, or were they, were you ever shifted to those types of, you know, stories that you were like, what am I doing? <laughs> I want to, I want to report on this, not this. Did you feel like you were ever pigeonholed because of being a female? I definitely think there was a pecking order in beats in the Washington Bureau. I don't know that it was gender related, but there were okay. A beats and there were B beats. The A beats were the White House, politics, economics, covering the Hill. The B beats were, were all the federal agencies whose initials you didn't know what they stood for. HHS, <laughs> HUD, et yeah. cetera. I didn't really see that, frankly, as being gender related, yeah. uh, but I suspect there probably was an element of that. I'll tell you one thing, though, I, having not worked at other publications, I don't know what it's like, but I do think that the journal is very much a merit-based organization, and you prove yourself, you get rewarded. In my case, I very quickly became one of the star reporters in the Chicago Bureau. I was getting more front page bylines than practically anybody else, not only in that bureau, but in the whole paper. But so were a couple of my male colleagues. But again, this is a story that I tell in Power Moms. I'm in my late 20s and the then bureau chief asked those two star male reporters as well as me, would you like to be a bureau chief as your next job? Because that was the stepping stone. The star reporters were then were promoted into being a bureau chief. And this becomes one of those lessons that I wish I had known back then that I talk about in that essay, which is I had no idea that when you're offered a career move, you actually have the right to say, can I have a day to think about this or get back to you tomorrow? I thought you had to decide on the spot. Yeah. And in my case, I'm married to a guy who's working for Business Week. I know if I say yes to becoming a bureau chief, I'll be offered a job in a very small bureau in a city that probably doesn't have a Business Week bureau, like Cleveland or Philadelphia. I very much kind of love this guy. I want to stay married to him. We're also at that point thinking maybe we want to have kids. I don't know any women in management who have children. There are no role models that I can look to either yeah. at their journal or anywhere else. So rather than saying, let me think about it, let me come back to you, all those thoughts flash through my head in 10 seconds and I say, not now, maybe later. Later never comes. I never became a bureau chief. Interesting. 
It's, you know, it's so funny because I find this generation is more empowered to take that day or take that week, which is, you know, I remember coming up and like being 22 and I got my first job and somebody offered to me, I was like, oh my God, I got a job offer done. I'll take it. You know, like it wasn't even a thought to not take, I was being given a job and I was so excited to have a paycheck. (laughs) I was like, done. If something else comes along down the road, I'll figure it out. But this is where life is sending me, you know? And I feel like this generation of women has been trained differently. That's how how we sabotage ourselves even today yeah when it comes to negotiating over pay and frankly when my first book comes out i have a very strong chapter in there about negotiating for what you're worth right i remember sharing the book with a journal colleague whose role was advising journal reporters before they moved to, into overseas assignments i at that point had already had my overseas assignment But I said to him, because this is now 2016, 2017, when my first book comes out, I said, now, of course, women don't accept the first pay increase they're offered, right? When they get transferred overseas, I hope, I hope. He says, no, actually, they all do. But the men don't. The men say, I want some time to think about it. And I was having that sense of deja vu because when I get offered a chance to move into management at the journal and they offer me a double digit pay increase, which was a bigger increase than the union ever had negotiated for us reporters. Plus I'm going to move to London and I'm going to be in management. It never occurred to me to say, can I think about that pay increase? Can I think about that? I did think about the offer. I did ask for time to think about the offer because I wasn't sure my husband was going to follow me, but it never occurred to me to question whether the pay increase I was being proposed was good, was comparable to what anybody else who had ever moved into this job had gone. I was just like you. I'm so grateful. It was, it's, it's blind trust. You want to give me. (laughs) It's so, it's so interesting because it's like, I think that's one of the reasons like, kind of breaking off on my own and doing my own thing because it's like you have these blind trust in organizations and and I don't know whether it was just the like cultural zeitgeist that you're like no they want to do well by me so they're of course they're going to give me you know you don't question it there was like that and I don't now it's such a different environment and I think so much is under a spotlight you know and I think a lot of it has to do with you know all of the different franchises that you did start it's like to look at it's like you were so ahead of the curve at the journal in terms of starting your columns and and pushing that to the forefront of how companies and enterprises should be looked at, you know, and how should they be evaluated and what should be on the top of your mind as you're looking at going into some of these bigger corporations that were driving, you know, both industry and culture forward. You know, it's like when you were starting those, it's like, were they, you know, obviously you had a passion and advocacy for, for, you know, women, D and I, and so forth at the time it's, but when you started it and you brought these ideas to your editors, you know, and your bureau chiefs, what did they say? Were they like, that's as, you know, were they accepting of it or did you have to really fight for it? Well, in terms of coverage, I think they were fairly accepting as long as these were timely topics to cover. I do remember at one point getting the unspoken or rather subtle message that the perception was that the careers and management group was maybe writing about women a little bit too much and we should kind of dial it back. But everything in journalism comes in waves. Things come in favor and go out of favor. And so the interest in writing about women and more broadly DEI issues you know, then came back into favor as lots of topics have done so. The thing I always found kind of amusing was as an employer, the Wall Street Journal and its parent Dow Jones seemed to be a lagging indicator. So generally by the time they recognized that we should be doing something, it was probably a trend that was kind of on its way out and we should be documenting that in the journal. I, I remember the managing editor saying we should be doing job posting well, we've been writing about this being a practice in the workplace for several (laughs) years. So I knew that was the clarion call that now it was probably losing its uh, popularity. As you were researching um, the different companies for management and career, were there things that you found in outside companies that you brought in as ideas to the journal as to how they should run or suggestions? Did, Did anything kind of become the journal culture then? Well, I definitely think by having asked for a reduced work schedule 
And again, I wasn't writing about workplace issues at the time, but by having asked for a reduced work schedule and initially getting turned down, but then having that proposal resuscitated when the management changed, when my bureau chief went from being a guy whose wife stayed at home to my bureau chief being Al Hunt married to Judy Woodruff, uh, cause celebra as we know, and they already had a child. And the management, managing editor also changed from someone who had a stay-at-home wife to a guy named Norm Perlstein, who had a very, very highly committed career wife. All those things then enabled me to essentially be a pace setter for other women at the journal. I, I'm not aware that there was any woman at the journal who had ever had the kind of reduced schedule I was able to negotiate which was for three years, I worked a four day work week, uh, not having to work longer days, but at full pay. And what that did was it set a model for other women and eventually men too, to ask for alternative schedules. So the Washington Bureau shortly after that had two women who proposed job sharing mm -hmm. and it was approved and it, and it worked out very well. As I got into writing about management and workplace issues and doing the career column, did any of the things I write about then end up trickling down to becoming journal practices? Some of them did, but it wasn't due to my own personal advocacy. I'm not gonna take credit for that. I think what's really important to remember here is the fact that there are many women here rowing this boat and that yeah. women acting in concert and paying it forward is what makes change happen. Yeah. So you have this example in Power Moms where one of the younger wave, and these were women in anywhere from their early 30s to their early 40s, who comes back from maternity leave for her management consulting firm immediately has to be on the road several days a week, but she's nursing. She has to then bring two suitcases along, one with her suitcase and one with all those bottles of expressed milk when she's coming home on Thursday night. She finds this very burdensome and frankly, it leaks at one point. She complains about this to one of her clients at a law firm. The law firm guy says, well, hey, at our law firm, we pay to ship home the breast milk of our traveling colleague. So rather than make this her issue, she brings it to the employee resource group, which at that point is for women or mothers. It then morphs to becoming one for parents. It has an executive sponsor. The company agrees to do a pilot. Pretty soon it's rolled out nationwide. They not only extend this benefit to the women who have to travel, who are the management consultants, but they tell the male management consultants, if you want to bring your wife along on a trip, and she's a nursing mother whose own employer doesn't pay for it, we'll ship her milk home too. But it wouldn't have happened but for the employee resource group, the yeah. mother and parents resource group, plus a very, very high placed, powerful executive sponsor. It's those kind mm -hmm. of comments that are necessary Because you kind of thought outside the box and created these columns and you were writing on all of these workplace issues, did you ever have the companies that you were covering and the stories that you know you were un unearthing in your column come to you and say like, I don't wanna be in this column or like, were they accepting of it? It's like, you've written on so many different companies on, you know, on so many different workplace and career issues. Did you ever find that they pushed back on you because they didn't want to be in the spotlight around these issues? All the time. <laughs> <That's> the <nature. laughs> but here, here's a comment that's relevant to women. So when I'm first writing about management and workplace issues, I was very sensitive to the fact that it seemed like all the sources we're quoting are men. Yeah. And so I concentrated on trying to get more women's voices into my stories. I often got pushback around that. And when I would ask, well, why can't I talk to your highest ranking woman or the woman who's in charge of X? The answer I would get often was the women in our company don't want to be interviewed because they get so much heat over being quoted. You know, they basically get outed or trashed or whatever. It It's not true any longer. Yeah. Totally. But I do remember doing one column about what were 
the career consequences for women who complained about being sexually harassed when the Me Too movement was in its heyday. Did coming out and actually bringing a sexual harassment complaint, even though it's confidential, and even though the settlement is confidential, does that end up hurting your chances for getting another job? The issue, of course, I had to deal with here was many of these women were bound by these confidentiality agreements and so didn't want their names used. I was able to find some that did, they, of course, did not want the name of the company mentioned, but my editor's reaction when they were first editing that column was, well, if, if you put in Jane Doe, who worked at a major law firm in DC where she was sexually harassed, anybody can do a LinkedIn search and find her in a jiffy. Why can't we name the law firm? And you know, the answer was, because I told her I wouldn't. And yeah. she was okay with having her, in that case, that woman was okay with having her name used. But, but then I got the same pushback from the editors. Well, isn't she worried about violating her confidentiality agreement? This is back before uh, these were no longer, you know, these now are considered no-nos, but this, when the you know Me Too movement first erupted four or five yeah. years ago, this was what was really hurting a lot of women from coming forward. It's so interesting because it's like one of the things that I think that we've seen and maybe it's just because I have such a specific view of like the last 20 years in journalism, you know, it's like the proliferation of content and the craft, right? It's like, if you look at like 2005 to 2000, you know, 12, you know, it's like, when you think of the journal, it's, it's such craftsmanship. There's a craftsmanship to the journalism, you know, in terms of like, what are your sources? You know, what are the stories? And then you kind of had this proliferation of online outlets that kind of came in, you know, that, you know, probably post 2010, you know, you had the tech crunches that came out and, you know, Pando Daily and, you know, all of those different kind of smaller ones because tech was so heavy. And now you have so many different outlets online, you know, it's like, you know, you have sub stacks, you have, <laughs> you know, how have you, how do you feel the craft has changed over the past few years, especially for some of the journalists that are, that are coming up in the industry of, you know, some of it's super fast paced, you know, then there's long form, there's print, you know, how has that changed? It's like, what is your perspective on that? Well, my perspective is we as a democracy benefit from having a huge chorus of voices not all of which we're ever gonna agree with and some of which frankly are slanderous and libelous, but I much prefer to live in a society when everyone can make their voice heard rather than only listening to what the government tells us we have to think or believe. But at the same time, I think there has been a deterioration of journalistic standards, both ethical as well as copy standards, but yeah. that, Partly it's because of the demand for instant gratification, instant news, and the fact there has been so much elimination of copy editing staff. It was one of the first things that got eliminated when the Wall Street Journal's parent company, Dow Jones, was, was bought by Mr. Murdoch. Uh, they just didn't have that next to last line of defense that you always could count on to catch the errors. So the number of corrections you started to see on page two of the Wall Street Journal went from maybe one every day or so to four or five or more some days. And an individual correction sometimes has multiple corrections in it. I can remember a day at the Wall Street Journal where a journal colleague got fired over what seemed to me not a firing offense, but I, I got it afterwards. He put in a story, I guess it was about the New York Times, that the New York Times had declined to comment about whatever it was he was writing about. Turned out he had not called the New York Times for comment, and his excuse was, well, I knew they wouldn't comment. You can't lie. No. So that was so that was fiery. <laughs> like, that's not something you can do. <laughs> it's, you know... It's interesting in terms of like the journalism, you know, it's like going back to what you said about how your editors and how you didn't quite agree with the opinion pages and that you weren't going to slant your articles. It's so interesting because I feel like that topic consistently comes up now when you look at the press. It's it's almost like the polarization of press of what's gone on. It's like growing up, you know, 
you think about, or you look at like the origins with journalism and you think of the Walter Cronkites and the trust. And it's like, do you feel that trust is, has been eroded in journalism these days? Or do you feel like that's not true? Well, because I think we have turned ourselves into many boring camps. I think in those individual camps, there's a fair amount of trust for that journalism. Yeah. So the folks who swear by everything they see or hear on Fox News certainly trust Fox News. Yeah. Those who don't certainly don't trust what they see or hear on, yeah. on Fox But I think your point is correct. I think overall, trust in all kinds of institutions has faded, whether it's government or the media or healthcare or education. And I think that trust is being rebuilt, frankly, from the ground up. In the case of journalism, you have this whole flourishing of nonprofit local news outfits. Yeah. In many cases, being bankrolled by foundations that were created by highly successful media companies to make sure that these local newspapers that have been dying by the hundreds, uh, that there isn't a news desert nationwide that we still hold our local officials and our school boards and our city councils accountable for how our children are educated, whether our streams are clean, whether the potholes ever get filled. Because at the end of the day, that is frankly the most important role that, that the media plays, that of the watchdog on behalf of the public. That's so true. It's like, that's just like it, but... <laughs> <laughs> on on so many levels um are you still involved with the the not the group that um was helping with the local local news and local i think it was um the the local news advisory team is that now, is that now i'm on the steering committee i'm the one who came up with the name for the group okay see my fourth grade prowess at thinking of titles for things <laughs> your <is> titles <laughs> Well, roaring strong. We're in the middle of launching uh, a couple of pilot projects for what we call LNAT, Local News Advisory Team. It's, oh, it's, a, it's a group cool. of it's a group of journal alums. Uh -huh. I got recruited to join this by a journal alum who happened to have been my managing editor at the Daily Northwestern when I was a sub. <laughs> the world gets smaller and smaller, right? <laughs> <laughs> So Joanne, I guess my, one of, you know, my last questions is, is more like when, when you go to the journal, it's like you still freelance for them and so forth. You know, do you, it's like, when you look at some of the new talent that's coming up, it's like, what do you tell them? It's like, how do you pay it forward to them? Or how are they looking at you from a mentorship standpoint? Well, the ones that I'm in touch with, I'm always trying to beg them for the latest gossip. <laughs> <laughs> To the extent they want my advice on uh, mentoring, I do highly encourage everyone to build, maintain, and then expand your network. Even if you are working virtually, and some of us still are doing that 100% of the time, you have ways in which you can expand and strengthen your network. You can't neglect it. I This came home to me in a very strong way about a week ago when I had coffee with a, a journal colleague who it turns out when he came to the journal, he asked several people in the New York Bureau to have coffee with him and kind of bring him up to speed as to what it would be like to work at the journal. Apparently I was the only one who actually did so and he never forgot this. So when he and I get together for coffee last week, he has just come out with his first book. I gave him a copy of Power Moms. He gave me not one, but two suggestions for venues for where I might be able to share insights about the book. He didn't have to do that, but he was remembering how I had mentored and networked with him, in this case, eight years ago when he came to the journal from the, the Dow Jones news side of the, of the operation. So my feeling is we all pay it forward, but women in particular have to pay it forward for other women. It's why all the women interviewed for both of my books spoke on the record, spoke frankly about their drawbacks as well as their successes. They want other women to flourish and to succeed and not have to repeat the same mistake. 
Yeah. And I feel very strongly about how important it is that every working woman act as a role model and pay it forward. One of the things I've, I've told my adult daughter when she joined the workforce is the second day you're on the job, you're already more senior than the person who got hired today. Oh, that's great advice. That's a great so perspective. Pay, <laughs> so pay it forward, pay it forward to today's newbie. Yep, absolutely. Uh, Joanne, it has been an absolute pleasure having you. So nice to meet you. Thank you so much for being with us. And we uh, we will continue to look out for all of your columns and your future books, I hope, because Power Moms <laughs> is fantastic. Yeah, it's great. Right. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much, Have Joanne. Bye. Bye. If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe and leave a review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. To stay up to date with In Her Words, join the conversation by following Women in Entertainment on our social channels and subscribe to our weekly newsletter at womenandentertainment.com. This week, we're talking to Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist and author Joanne Lublin. She talks with us about her fascinating career as the former management news editor of the Wall Street Journal. She also initiated and wrote Wall Street Journal's first career advice column. She won the Pulitzer Prize for stories exposing corporate scandals and the challenges female executives faced and overcame in many male-dominated fields. Today, Joanne gives us insight into her incredible journey and how she's seen the journalism landscape change over more than four decades long career. We hope you enjoy. This week, we're talking to Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and author Joanne Lublin. She talks with us about her fascinating career as the former management news editor of the Wall Street Journal. She also initiated and wrote the Wall Street Journal's first career advice column. She won the Pulitzer Prize for stories exposing corporate scandals and the challenges women executives faced and overcame in many dominated... F- mm. Okay, third time's a charm. This week, we're talking to Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and author Joanne Lublin. She talks with us about her fascinating career as the former management news editor of the Wall Street Journal. She also initiated and wrote the Wall Street Journal's first career advice column. She won the Pulitzer Prize for stories exposing corporate scandals and the challenges female executives faced and overcame in many male dominated fields. Today, Joanne gives us insight into her incredible journey and how she has seen the journalism landscape change over her more than four decades long career. Today, Joanne gives us insight into her incredible journey and how she's seen the journalism landscape change over more than... God, I can't get this. Today, Joanne gives us insight into her incredible journey and how has she seen the journalism landscape change over her more than four decades long career. We hope you enjoy.